more of your favorites from yesterday and today. 1410 WELM Elmira, a Robert Funtner group station. Get set for laughs. Hello there, I'm Victor Ives, and this is the golden age of radio theater. Yes, this is the program where we turn back the clock to relive those golden moments of radio's yesteryear to bring you some of the greatest radio entertainment of all time. This time on the golden age of radio theater, Fibber McGee and Molly and Duffy's Tavern. Our Fibber McGee and Molly show is a pre-war vintage program from May 6, 1941. In this program, Fibber and Molly collect games, books, and magazines for the boys in camp. And then later this hour, we visit Duffy's Tavern from 1951 with a special guest star, Slapsy Maxie Rosenblum. But first, let's visit 79 Wistful Vista and Fibber McGee and Molly. With Bill Thompson, Gail Gordon, Arthur Q. Bryan, Dick Legrand, and me, Harlow Wilcox. The squire of 79 Wistful Vista and his neighbor Gildersleeve are typical red-blooded Americans. They love all kinds of sports and exercise. For instance, here we meet these two sportsmen in an atmosphere of tense excitement, with masculine violence boiling just beneath the surface as they match their skill and wits in a battle for supremacy. It's your move, Gildersleeve. Yes, I know. Ah, oh, my, it's nice to see you two boys playing checkers peacefully together instead of fighting and bickering. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm a peace-loving man, Mrs. McGee, and if my little chum and I can't get along together like any good friends, I'd... Here, here, what are you doing, McGee? Well, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm jumping three of your men. There, thereby winning the game. <laughs> now, wait a minute, McGee. You missed two squares. Why, I never know such a thing. You did, too. I saw you. You moved from here to here to here. I did not. I moved from here to here to here to here. Didn't I, Molly? I'm sorry I wasn't looking. But I know McGee wouldn't cheat, Mr. Gildersleeve. I wish I was as sure of that as you are, Mr. <laughs> Wait a minute, Throckmorton. You, you cad. Who's a cad? You're a cad. No, on second thought, you ain't a cad. You're only a fliver. A broken down Model T fliver. Is that so? Yes, that's Why, right. you indeterminate little sand flea? Anybody that would cheat a checker. Don't you accuse me of cheating, you tub tummy ton of toggin flirm. Why, you little... What's toggin flirm? <laughs> That's the bait they use to catch renifers. Uh, what are renifers? What are renifers? What's the matter with you? Don't you know anything? By George, I'm going home. Well, I refuse to play checkers with any bullheaded little beetle brain like you, McGee. Okay, you big baby. Take your coaster wagon and go crying home to Mama. You can't take it. That's what's the matter with you. Well, maybe I can't take it, but I can ladle it out, McGee. <laughs> One more insulting remark from you, and I'll beat your brains out, if I can borrow a feather duster. You'll beat my brains out. Why, you hollow-headed hippo, you couldn't poke your way out of a hairnet. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Give me that checkerboard. Oh, but Molly, we, we, we can't quit now. We're, we're tied, seven and seven. Oh, let us play just one more game, Mrs. McGee. We'll be quiet, won't we, little chum? <laughs> We were just kidding. Well, all right then. Just one more game. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> and after this, I'll keep my eye on you, chum. Well, that's a... What do you mean? What for? So you won't cheat. Oh, so you still claim I cheated, do you? Now you listen to me, you overstuffed apple. Be quiet. quiet, the both of you. And give me that checkerboard again. McGee, go upstairs and put on a clean shirt for dinner. And you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes? Go home. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. McGee. Go home. <laughs> Gee whiz, I didn't... You mean... heard what the lady says, Gildersleeve. Scram. I'll not have my home turned into a... Into a... Oh, well, I won't have it turned into. <laughs> I might have known this peace and quiet wouldn't last. Good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, good night. 
Good night, little chump. <laughs> Hey, look, Molly, we wasn't... Hey, what you doing? I'm wrapping this checkerboard up. Give me a piece of string. What you wrapping it up for? I'm going to give it away. Oh, now, wait a minute. Just because Gildersleeve and me get into a little argument now and then, Chuck, that does us good. I know that. Well, then what's your idea? If it does two fighting men that much good, think what it will do for the Army. <laughs> the Army? What's the Army? Sure, guy? I read in the paper where the boys in camp are short on games and books and magazines. So I'm going to send them this checkerboard, thus helping the War Department out there... And peace department out here. <laughs> you still object, dearie? Well, no, I guess not. But but don't don't send the checkerboard. Just send, send them the Parcheesi outfit. <laughs> oh, I doubt if them dice would be used for Parcheesi. <laughs> Why don't you send that cribbage board of yours? You can't use it anymore. Why not? It's full of holes. Mm, termites. <laughs> Dearie, while we're at it, let's send a lot of things. They need books and magazines, too. That's a great idea, Molly. This house is getting all cluttered up with books anyway. Must be a half a dozen around here. <laughs> Look, McGee, I've got a great idea. Huh? Let's go see all our friends and collect a lot of games and books and magazines and send them to camp. Yeah, that's a swell idea, Molly, but look, please don't send my checkerboard. Uh, I and Gildersleeve are tied seven and seven. We've got to play it off to see oh, who's champion. Oh, go on. Draw pennies or pitch straws for it. Now, come on. We'll call on everybody we know and get them to donate games and books. You, you're still going to send my checkerboard? Definitely. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give up my ping-pong set instead. I'll throw in my wood-burning outfit, my model airplane kit, and the ship I'm building in the bottle. <laughs> no, we'll just send the checkerboard and the ping-pong. Uh, incidentally, you know how ping-pong got its name? No. It was invented by two Chinese fellas, Fui Ping and Charlie Pong. <laughs> Why, how interesting. You still going to send my checkerboard? <laughs> yes, and uh, go get the ping pong set. You know where it is. Sure. Where? Right here in the hall closet. <laughs> Got to straighten out that closet one of these days. <laughs> You're listening to the Fibber McGee and Molly Show on the Golden Age of Radio Theater. With you know, Jim we get a lot in just a moment. A Jim and Marion Jordan as Fibber McGee and Molly. Isn't it wonderful how everybody is cooperating on this thing, dearie? Yep. Heavenly days, we must have a half a ton of books and games and magazines promised already. Yep, they'll never miss my checkerboard now. <laughs> So let's keep it night and play off the championship with Gildersleeve. Now, now, now. I thought we had that all settled. The checkerboard is going. Well, Shucks, I don't know why you got to send my favorite stuff. You'd have sent my easy chair to the Army, too, if it hadn't had flat feet. <laughs> oh, for goodness sakes, anybody think your life depended on one measly little checker game? Mine don't, but Gildersleeve's does. <laughs> It'll kill him if I win. <laughs> hey, here's Nick DePopolis' house. Let's see what he can give us. Well, let me see. If he offers... Well, for scream sakes, Fizzer and Cupid, this is an unexpected aided pleasure. What's roasting? Huh? <laughs> he means what's cooking, dearie. Oh. <laughs> Look, Mr. DePopolis, we're collecting games and books and magazines for the boys in camp. Now, what have you got that we can have? Hmm. Well, I don't think we have any games, Cupid, unless you can use some jigsaw poodles. <laughs> Jigsaw puzzles are swell, Nick. Uh, how about books and magazines, though? Now you are beginning to talk sense with something to it. Oh. I am having a superfluity of books, and I'm happy to get rid of them. Oh, well, thanks, Mr. DePopolis. Send them over to our house, and we'll have a truck ready to take them out to camp. Yeah, why are you so glad to get rid of them, though, Nicholas? Oh, they're too hard on my eyes, Fizzer. Oh, you read a lot, Mr. DePopolis? I don't read at all, Cupid. But my kids are always playing catch with them and hitting me in the face. <laughs> Yesterday, I'm getting smacked with Gone with the Wind, and for ten minutes, I'm hearing for who the bells are ringing. <laughs> well, I'll send them over. Thank you. Now, get a load of the brass knocker, Molly. You think anybody as well off as Uppington could afford a doorbell? <laughs> she probably thinks a quaint old knocker expresses her personality, McGee. <laughs> you mean she has a need for a knocker because she's knock-kneed? <laughs> Don't you get it? I said she uh, has... Ah, taint funny, McGee. <laughs> she would be in a bathing suit. <laughs> Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Uppington? Oh, how do you do, Mrs. McGee? And Mr. McGee? Good afternoon, Uppy. Where's your butler? Oh, uh, you mean Snathers? 
Oh, I lost him last Saturday. Oh, oh hmm. that's too bad. You know, he always interested me in a strange way. How was that, Molly? Well, he had an expression on his face that reminded me of, uh, of, uh, well, I don't know exactly, but there was a look in his eye that, uh, uh, well, did you ever clean fish? <laughs> Where'd you happen to lose the old frozen puss, Uppy? <laughs> uh, Maeve is all very strange. Puss, eh? Yes, he was serving dinner, and the radio was broadcasting the Kentucky Derby, oh, the and dark. after Whirlaway had run the race, mm -hmm. Snathers picked up the strawberry shortcake, danced around a bit, and then said, Here, old girl, wear this for a mask. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know, the first thing I knew, I was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, dear. Well, I don't blame you for firing him, Abigail. Oh, but I didn't, my dear. He just quit. <gasps> oh, man, I wish there was some way to get him back. Do you mean to stand there with your velvet neckband full of Adam's apple and tell me you want that guy back? <laughs> Why, of course I do, Mr. McGee. Well, I don't understand it either, Mrs. Uppington. Why? Why, because through him I found how wonderful crushed strawberries and whipped cream are for the complexion. Oh. <laughs> I give up. Come on, Molly, let's Oh, go. just a second, dear. You forgot what we came for. Oh, yes. The magazines for the boys in camp, remember? Yes. Oh, yes, of course. I have them right here, all ready for you. <laughs> oh, well, how did you know about it, Abigail? Oh, you told Mr. Gildersleeve, and he told his wife, and she mentioned it to the grocer, and he is strictly a guy who tells everybody everything. <laughs> oh, boy, take a squint at these magazines. Magazines, Molly. Nasty Confessions, Fantastic Mechanics, Bloodthirsty Heartthrobs, True House Detective Stories, Curvy Cutie Cartoons. Why, Abigail, I never knew you read this type of literature. Me? Well, really, Mrs. McGee, these belong to the servants. Oh. I consider myself insulted. Well. And you'd realize that if you ever read these magazines from cover to cover, as I always do. I... Oh, what am I saying? Goodbye! <laughs> What we want is games and books and magazines for the boys in camp. Yes, they're a little short of recreational supplies, Mr. Wilcox. I see. Well, I've got a croquet set that's hardly been used. No, you don't get the idea, Harlow. No, nothing elaborate, elaborate like that. Just, just small stuff. Haven't you anything you can hold on your lap? Well, my secretary, Miss Clegg... Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Wilcox. Well, now, wait a minute. You wait a minute. I was going to say, my secretary, Miss Clegg, will go through my house and see what she can find. Oh. And you say you want a lot of books and magazines, too? That's the idea, Mr. Wilcox. Just send them over to our house, and thank you very much. Oh, not at all. I was in the Army myself, and I know how it is. Oh, what, what was you in the Army, Wilcox? Well, <laughs> most of the time I was on kitchen police. As a matter of fact, I still am. Really? Uh, folks, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> Science has never discovered any way to keep flies out of the cream pitcher, moths out of bathing suits, and Wilcox out of sales talk. <laughs> but we can dream, can't we? <laughs> okay, Wilcox, I'll go along with you. How come you're still on kitchen police? <laughs> Why, that's simple. I'm responsible for arresting the wear and tear and the cracking and warping of linoleum. Oh. And as an old kitchen policeman, I can assure you that grime doesn't pay. Come on, <laughs> Rounding up books and magazines and games to send out to the army camp. Now, have you got anything for us? Well, now, I would just love to help you out, Mrs. McGee. <laughs> but I wouldn't dare give anything away without consulting my wife. Well, go ahead and consult her, Wimple. Oh, I couldn't disturb her now, Mr. McGee. She's taking her music lessons. Oh. Does she sing, Mr. Wimple? No, she plays the... Well, wait. I'll open the door to the music room, just a fraction, and we'll see her in action. <laughs> she's, she's very talented, don't you think? <laughs> well, she's certainly got what it takes. <laughs> yes, indeedy. Now, if somebody would only take what she's got and throw it away, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'd get a little peace and quiet around here. Have you uh, protested, Mr. Wimple? Oh, many times, Mrs. McGee. I often say to her, Cornelia, I say, why don't you give up those drums and go back to your other hobby? 
What was her other hobby? Lion taming. <laughs> Heavenly days, lion taming. Yes, she uses our kitchen chairs, too. They're all scarred up with teeth marks. Oh. Believe me, that varnish tastes terrible. <laughs> My goodness, I, I don't know why I'm getting so personal. I'll send over whatever I can, Mrs. McGee. Well, thank you, Mr. Wimple. Oh, not at all. The boys in camp will sure appreciate it, Wimple. And I speak as one who knows. Old army man myself, you know. I belong to the home guard once. Oh. But my wife doesn't like me to have a gun around the house. Oh. She says I might accidentally shoot her sometime. <laughs> That woman is positively uncanny. <laughs> but, Mr. McGee, what were you in the Army? I was cook of Company C, Wallace, just like my father was before me. Son of a sea cook, McGee, I was known as. <laughs> oh, my. Son of a sea cook, McGee, celebrated in story and song as the super supervisor of the soup stove, the skillful scientific Samson of the sizzling steak skillet, and the snappy sergeant of the spud skinning squad, smooth as silk at supplying a seafood spree by subdividing a sardine into sufficient servants to satisfy six or seven small soldiers, smart as a city slicker at switching skinny shrimps into sleek and strong supermen by stuffing same with sausages, sandwiches, and similar succulent snacks, a sturdy citizen at stock and stomach swimple, but let's hear the king's men singing something simple. The King's Men sing, Polly, put the kettle on. Oh, Polly, what do you want? Polly, put the kettle on, the kettle on, the kettle on. Polly, put the kettle on and we can have some tea. Polly, put the kettle on, the kettle on, the kettle on. Polly, put the kettle on and we can have some tea. Get out the cookies, we're gonna have a treat. I'll sweep the crumbs away, you'll sweep me off my feet. Polly, put the kettle on, the kettle on, the kettle on. Polly, put the kettle on and settle down with me. Polly, put the kettle on. 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 Let's have tea. Hot cross buns, Ooh. hot cross buns, one a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. Polly, put the kettle on, I'll go buy a bun. When the tea is boiling, we'll have fun. Polly, put the little kettle on, the little kettle on, the little kettle on. Polly, put the little kettle on, have a little tea for two. Put a little sugar in to make it sweet, stir it up, make it sweet. Add a little lemon and turn on the heat, you and me for tea. Better get the butter and the jelly and the cream, the gingerbread cookies by the score. Hand me down that glow coat, we'll eat right off the floor. Oh, Polly. Put the kettle on. Polly. Put the kettle on. Oh, you golly, Polly, won't you put on the kettle and settle down. Settle down. Polly, put the kettle on, the kettle on, the kettle on. Then settle right down with me. You're listening to the Fibber McGee and Molly Show from 1941 on the golden age of radio theater. Books and magazines and stuff to send off to the boys in camp. Here, load these books in the truck, McGee. Load them in yourself, Gildersleeve. I'm the hizzy. Why, you're not either, McGee. Huh? Mr. Gildersleeve and I have done almost all the work. Okay, yeah. okay. Hey, give me a hand with this ping-pong outfit, Gildersleeve. Uh, certainly, Chum. You take the table and I'll take the balls and rackets. <laughs> Come on, now, boys, let's hurry and get... Hello, kids, what's cooking? Oh, hi, old-timer. We're loading all these books and magazines and games and stuff into the truck. We're taking them to the soldiers. By the way, McGee, uh, do you know the way out there to the camp? No, not exactly. Hey, old-timer. Hey! Which is the best way to camp? Well, I always say the best way to camp is to pick out a piece of high ground near some running water, then pitch a tent... No, and... no. <laughs> what? No. Which is the best way to the army camp? Hey! Oh, oh, that! Well, uh, daughter, best way is to drive out of town any direction till you see a soldier standing beside the road. Then you go whichever way his thumb is pointing, see? <laughs> <laughs> now, that's very intelligent, but I knew you could tell us, old-timer. You've got such a wise face. <laughs> <laughs> that's what everybody says, Johnny. 
It says I got a lot of intelligence in my face for my age. <laughs> yes, you got a lot of age in it, too. <laughs> It's your face that convinces me that a puss has nine lives. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, Throckmorton. But that ain't the way I hear it. <laughs> no, sir. The way I hear it, one fella says, tell the fella, say, say, you've been reading about that lady bullfighter down in Mexico? Yep, says tell the fella, wonderful, ain't she? How'd she ever learn to dodge them wild animals? Dunno, says the first fella. But they say she used to be a cigarette girl in a nightclub. <laughs> get out of the way. Now, get out of the way while we finish loading this stuff, old It's timer. all loaded, McGee. Oh. It is. And a wonderful lot of stuff, too. Now, who's going to drive? I am. Oh, wait a minute, McGee. Who was it that borrowed this truck? Whose idea was it to collect this stuff? Mine. You want to drive, Molly? No. Okay, okay I'll, I'll drive. drive. I'll settle the kids. I'll drive. Well, Mom. fine. Let's get going. Get in, boys. Come on. <laughs> Hey, not so fast, old-timers. Slow down. How do you do it? Yep. Why, take your foot off the accelerator. Where is it? Oh. <laughs> Heavenly days, didn't you ever drive a car before? No, but it's fun, ain't it? Oh. 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 Yes, I'm the morale and recreation officer, Captain Gordon. Uh, you're Mr. McGee? No, thank goodness, this is Mr. McGee. Oh. <laughs> and this is my wife, Molly Cap. How do you do, I'm sure. Delighted, Mrs. McGee. And I wish to express the appreciation of our whole camp for the trouble you've gone to to get these recreational <laughs> facilities together for us. Where shall we unload them, Cap? Uh, the men are already starting to unload the truck, Mr. McGee. The recreation house is right next door. Uh, by the way, I didn't meet this gentleman. What gentleman? There ain't any... Yeah. Oh, this guy. <laughs> this is Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Cap Gordon, Rocky. Uh, how do you do, sir? <laughs> and thank you also, Mr. Gildermorton. <laughs> you, uh, you don't know how much you people have contributed to the morale and well-being of our boys. A fine group of young men, and we have to see that they have fun, you know. Now, uh, come on, Gildy. We better go help unload the stuff. Oh, oh yes. Uh, okay, McGee. Uh, see you later, Captain. Uh, certainly, certainly. Well, so you really think this was a good idea, do you, General? Splendid, Mrs. McGee. Splendid. A great thought, but... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, don't call me general. I'm only a captain. Oh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, when McGee was in the army, he was only a sergeant. You know, two stripes on his sleeve. Uh, two stripes is a corporal. It is? Why, he always said he was... Why, that little rascal in all these years, I believe... <laughs> well, come, Mrs. McGee. Let's go and see if the men have that truck unloaded, eh? All right. Well, that was fast work. The truck is empty. But where are McGee and Gildersleeve? I don't know. I, I say, my good fellow... Did you see the two men who came with this truck? Sure did, Admiral. They went right in there. Said they had to finish up. Finish up? Oh, finish up unpacking those things. Well, come on, Captain. Well, well heavenly day. Okay, Gildersleeve, it's your move. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... While we had some fun with the idea of getting games and books and magazines together for the boys in camp, it is a good idea. Good night. Good night, all. And that's the Fibber McGee and Molly Show from May 6th, 1941, on the Golden Age of Radio Theater. I want you to forget everything you've ever heard about getting rid of wrinkles. What if I personally told you... You now with Duffy's Tavern. Ed Gardner stars as Archie, the manager at Duffy's Tavern, where the elite meet to eat. And the special guest star is one Slapsy Maxie Rosenberg. Duffy's Tavern, where the elite meet the eat. Archie, the manager speaking. Duffy ain't here. Oh, hello, Duffy. Huh? Well, we just had a couple of them government inspectors in again. Yeah, they was kicking about the ceiling on our food. I know it's a no regulation, but they was kicking about our other ceiling. A couple of pieces of it fell in their soup. Well, I think we should be proud that we're the only restaurant in town where a customer can get plastered eating soup. Huh? Well, the only other guy you could 
call a celebrity that was in tonight was Dr. Torpy, the tree surgeon. The tree surgeon. Yeah, that's the guy. Seems one of his patients needed a transfusion. Yeah. He was here looking for sap donors. So I told him to hang around a while and Maxie Rosenblum would be here. Yeah, Maxie, the fighter. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to have him down here. You know, he lends such dignity and... Uh, Eclair to the place. <laughs> Such a real gentleman, you know. In his, in his whole life, he never hit anybody outside of the ring. Come to think of it, he never hit anybody inside of the ring. <laughs> well, I'm going to try to get him to act in our new floor show. But Duff, he's a natural for floor show. Whoever spent more time on the floor than Rosenblum. <laughs> Uh, by the way, Duffy, I want to ask you. You see, it's going to take a little money to put this floor show on, and I was wondering... Hello? <laughs> hmm. That's Duffy. Now, let me see. Where else can I raise the dough? Oh, uh, Miss Duffy. Yeah, Archie. Hi, but you're beautiful and charming and radiant today. All I can let you have is $2. <laughs> Two dollars, huh? Is that all you got? No. Oh. May I say that you are also luscious and gorgeous and devastating? Well, maybe I'll let you have another dollar. But that's all. Let me look at your dream boat. You know, you're getting prettier by the minute. Thank you. Now, let me look at you again. You know, you look exactly like Hetty Lamar. Archie, give me back that money. Why? I don't think that last compliment was sincere. <laughs> no, the others. Look, Miss Duffy, the dough ain't for me. It's, it's for our new floor show. Who's going to be in the floor show? Maxie Rosenblum. Then why don't you tell him how pretty he is? <laughs> Miss Duffy, there's a limit to me hypocrisy. <laughs> there's certain things I wouldn't even do for money. Besides, uh, how do I know whether he's got any dough? Well, he must have. He was a fighter for 15 years, wasn't he? Yeah, that's right. He must have saved some money. 15 years laying on his back. <laughs> think of the saving in shoe leather alone. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll try and get Maxie to back me. It might be a good switch. What do you mean? An angel with cauliflower wings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know, it wouldn't be bad for him. This would be a sound, profitable investment for a good, shrewd businessman. And I think he might be just punchy enough to do it. Just a second, Archie. Nobody could be that punchy. How do you do? Well, the mad Russian. <laughs> Tell me, Russian, uh, what about you? Have you got any money? Have I got any money? In my new business, I am making money like it's coming off a printing press. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh... How are you making it? Opa printing press. <laughs> Just a minute, Russian. It's against the law to print real money. That's where I outsmart the law. I am printing only counterfeit money. <laughs> hey. Well, that, that's pretty smart. I think so, too. Here, take a look. What is it? My latest $3 bill. <laughs> Three dollar... Look, Russian, the government don't make three dollar bills. So it cuts down the competition. <laughs> Look, tell me. Yeah? How much do you sell these three dollar bills for? Two dollars plus sales tax. <laughs> A sales tax? Yes, yeah, just to keep it legal, of course. <laughs> well, let me look at this bill again. Russian. Hey, this green bag. What about it? It's blue. For a small additional sum, I'm giving you the name of a colorblind bank teller. <laughs> well, look, as long as, uh, as long as you're so rich, how would you like to back a floor show? I should throw bad money after bad. <laughs> but Russian, it could be a lot of fun, you know. Maybe you, maybe you could be in the show, sing a song or something. Please, Archie, I have absolutely no talent. Ah, go on. You got just as much talent as I have. Don't rub it in. I just admitted it. <laughs> Come on, Russian. You know everybody's a ham at heart. Don't you have a little yearning to be in show business? Mm -hmm. That I am having only once. When? 
at the circus. They needed a man to be shot out of a cannon. A human cannonball, huh? Yes, but they turned me down. Why? I was the wrong caliber. <laughs> this particular failure came as a great blow to my theatrical family. Yet, your family was show people? And very successful. In fact, my father was the first man to saw a woman in half. Really? What did he get for it? The electric chair. <laughs> Maybe I better go back to Maxie. Hey, Archie, if you want entertainment for this floor show, why overlook me? A great singer right here under your very nose. Miss Duffy, it was me very nose that made me decide to overlook you. <laughs> hmm. What do you know about music, anyway? I know as much as you do. A lot, that is. <laughs> oh, yeah? Ask me something about music. Okay. How many kinds of opera are there? How many kinds of opera? A uh, tree. Light, grand, and horse. Hmm. Okay, so you made a lucky guess. <laughs> All right, you think it's a lucky guess? Uh, ask me something else about music. Okay. What's a treble? A treble? Uh, that's when you sing and uh, you get up to a high note and your voice quibbles. <laughs> Don't be silly. That's a treble <laughs> Treble. Miss Duffy, the word happens to be tremulo. Oh. Well, ask me another question. <laughs> ask you? Okay, I'll go along with the gag. Tell me, Mr. Fatterman, uh, what is a concerto? A concerto? Yeah. It's a small accordion. A small... That's a concerto tina. <laughs> Concerto, Miss Duffy, is a musical piece uh, similar to a Sinatra. Uh... <laughs> Only difference is that it's played on an etude. <laughs> what you don't know about music would fill a hole in the ground. <laughs> From April 13th, 1951, the Golden Age of Radio Theater is presenting Duffy's Tavern. To Duffy's Tavern, and Ed Gardner's guest star, Maxie Rosenblum. Hey, Archie, have you figured out the act for the floor show? Well, I'm working on a budget right now. Now, let me see. We'll have seven chorus girls. No, I'm off on Sunday. Uh... <laughs> Better make it six chorus girls. I see. It only leaves room in a budget. That's only three dollars for a bubble dancer. Three dollars for a bubble dancer. You better get a midget and a grape. <laughs> Might be a nice gesture for our under the table trade. <laughs> oh, say look! Huh? And somebody just threw in a hat. So what? Maxie Rosenblum must be here. Maxie Rosenblum, Miss Duffy, they wouldn't throw in a hat. They would have thrown in a towel. <laughs> well, Max, I see you got me a letter, huh? Yeah, I had it read to me. <laughs> had it read? You mean a guy like you don't know your ABCs? Oh, them I know, but after that, it gets a little hazy. <laughs> Well, that's understandable. When you get up around K, L, and M, you know, anybody's liable to get confused. Uh, hey, Max, is that a new watch you got there? Yeah, it was an award for my prize fighting. Oh, yeah? From whom? The art critics. <laughs> the art critics? What did they give you an award for? Well, they said I spent more time on a canvas than Whistler's mother. <laughs> well, enough of this intellectual talk. Uh, your letter said you wanted me to act in your floor show. I'm going to let you do something even better than that. What? I'm going to let you, lucky Maxie Rosenblum, put up all the money for the show. I've been fouled. <laughs> but Max, it's going to be a great show, just like a Broadway production. The answer is no. But, but look, there'll be comedy. No. Music. No. Chorus girls. How much money do you need? <laughs> Well, let's see. Uh, light scenery, costumes, uh, my salary. Oh, I should say in the neighborhood of a thousand bucks. Well, let's move to a cheaper neighborhood. <laughs> okay, I'll make it 48 bucks. I'll work free. 
Well, I'll think it over. Of course, you've got to let me tell my jokes in the show. You got jokes, huh? Yeah, I got knockouts. <laughs> Beauty. Now he gets knockouts. <laughs> hey, Arch, Arch, get a load of this. Now, you ask me if I ever fought Max Bear. Better yeoman a guy. Uh, Maxie, did you ever fight Max Bear? No. I always wore trunk. <laughs> get it? <laughs> I got it. I got it all over me. Uh, hey, Archie. Hmm? Oh, it's you, Maxwell. <laughs> Maxwell? Well, Miss Duffy, you sure look beautiful today. Yeah, Maxie, shake your head and look again. <laughs> Archie, no kidding, this dame does something to me. She perks me up like, like a sniff of ammonia. <laughs> oh, Archie, isn't he cute? I just love his little pink ear. <laughs> and the other one, too. What is this? This low-budget Romeo and Juliet. No, Archie, this is the real thing, honest. You see, I've always wanted to have a welterweight in the family. <laughs> She's it. Duffy's finally got a nibble. You know, Maxie, uh, uh, you know, something, if you back our floor show, you and Miss Duffy could see a lot of each other. And there's a lot of both of us to see. <laughs> Boy, that'll be swell. But before I give any cash, I want to see the show. You mean an audition? Uh -huh. Well, I wasn't quite prepared to, uh... Look, Arch, I ain't taking a pig to a poke. <laughs> What do you think you're doing with Miss Duffy? <laughs> well, look, I'll see if I can whip something together and I'll give you an idea what the show will look like. Hey, come on, Maxwell. Let's go over and sit at that corner table. Okay, honey. I'll show you my rosin burns. <laughs> hey, Russian. Russian, come here. Look, you got to help me put on a show for our angel. Archie, where is this angel of yours? The angel? That's him sitting in the corner there with, uh, with his harpy. <laughs> Now, I'm stuck for talent, and you got to help me out. Archie, only once in my life I'm being in a floor show. It was terrible. Terrible. Everybody kept yelling, take it off, take it off. What's so terrible about that? They were referring to my head. <laughs> Look, Russian, all I want you to do is get up and entertain the folks. You know, maybe tell some jokes or recite something. All right, everybody, leave us down to audition in a floor show for Slapsy Maxie. Now... I'm the MC. Fram, fram, please. Thank you, Union. <laughs> Folks, I take great pride in presenting that beloved mirth cap of merriment, your friend and mine, Archie. <laughs> Folks, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the studio tonight. I discovered some new liver pills. I gave these pills to my uncle who had liver trouble. These liver pills was wonderful. Three days after my uncle died, they had to dig him up and beat his liver to death with a baseball bat. <laughs> Don't explain it to him, madam. Leave him figure it out for himself. <laughs> Another funny thing happened as I arrived at the theater tonight. The chorus girl's dressing room caught on fire. The firemen were there six hours. It took us one hour to put out the fire and five hours to put out the fireman. <laughs> Mother, get your field of glove. I'm batting them out tonight. <laughs> Recitation. She wore her stockings inside out all through the summer heat. She said it cooled her off to turn the hose upon her feet. <laughs> Nothing, huh? <laughs> and now, folks, we give you another great wit. He's half yours and half mine. Burke Gordon, the Russian Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> Darling. Good evening, good evening, good evening. And now I would like to tell you a screamingly funny joke, but for one unfortunate circumstance. I forgot it. Oh, Russian, try to remember. It's got a big laugh line. You see, you say it's raining cats and dogs outside. Yeah. Then I say, how do you know it's raining cats and dogs? And then you take the laugh line. You say... Because I just stepped into a poodle. <laughs> that's very for you. That's very for you. Uh -huh. Now, let us try it. 
folks. It's raining cats and dogs outside. Oh, really? How do you know? I just sat on the lifeline. <laughs> Russian, you ruined the joke. Definitely sorry. Shall we chance it again? Okay, we'll try another joke. You say, there's a fly on my nose. Then I say, shall I brush him off? And you say, why? Is he dusty? Okay. Now leave us trying. They will. Oh, I say, old chap, there's a fly on my nose. Shall I brush him off? No, I just stepped in a poodle. <laughs> Russian, no. Cats and dogs? No. Raining outside? No, no. There's a fly on my nose. Well, why don't you brush him off? Because he ain't dusty. That's <laughs> very for you. That's very for you. I just stepped into a poodle. Well, Maxie, there's a sample for you. Now, what do you say? You're going to back the show? I don't know, Archie. Hmm? Uh, when you planning to uh, put the show on? Well, next week. Why? Well, I don't think the jokes will keep that long. <laughs> hey, I got a good idea. What? Put me in the show. Why? Well, you want some life in this turkey, don't you? Well, what can you do? Why can I recite? Well, this should be worth hearing. Okay, folks, we now present the well-known poet Maxie Rosenblum, the short Count Longfellow. <laughs> I am just a fragrant violet In the mossy clad I dwell I frolic not, nor do I sing I just stand here and smell I'm a vine of creepy ivory I grow flat against the wall I don't grow like other flowers I just lay on my belly and crawl. <clears throat> I am just a shy little buttercup. I open my petals. See? <laughs> and I say to the clouds, glittering above, Oh, please, would you sprinkle on me? <laughs> Back to the floor show. Friends, we will now astound you with an exhibition of mind reading and mental telepathy. <laughs> Presenting that famous Hindu mystic, the Majaraja of Chutney, also known as the Goon of Rangoon. <laughs> Fellow Sahibs and Sahibises, <laughs> my first demonstration will be to answer your questions. Without using my feet or hands. <laughs> we'll start with this gentleman here, the one with the cauliflower face. <laughs> Tell me, pal, what do you see in my future? Your future? Let me see. Oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, oh. ho, ho. I'm seeing you in the arms of a blonde. Hey, that's swell. Is it a chorus girl? No, it's a referee. <laughs> He's carrying you to your corner. Next person. You, sir. I beg your pardon. Uh, tell me, Swami, can you see anything in my future? This is a future. <laughs> Just one minute. Some letters are flashing before me. N A B Y. Navy? Does that mean I'm going to meet a sailor? No, it means you're built like a battleship. <laughs> Now I will blindfold the Majaraja, and if you people in the audience hold up objects, he will identify them. All right, Majaraja, what are them two gentlemen in the corner holding up? The one with the gun in his hand. Yeah. <laughs> He's holding up the other gentleman. <laughs> very good, Majaraja. Very, very good. And, uh, and this gentleman here, this gentleman in the first row. A blackjack. <laughs> Correct. And that gentleman over there. A letter from his parole board. <laughs> Excellent. And what's that lady in the corner holding up? Her husband. He can't stand by himself. 
Remarkable, Marjorie Roger. However do you do it? It's very simple. I peek. <laughs> well, Maxie, Maxie, that's our floor show. What do you think of it? Well, with a lot of work and rehearsal, it may get to the point where it's just terrible. <laughs> but I think I'll put up some money. You put up the money? Oh, gee. Well, look, wait a while. On what condition? That my little pigeon, Miss Duffy, sings in the show. But your little pigeon is a vulture. <laughs> Wait a minute, what am I saying? Of course, we'll be happy to have Miss Duffy sing in the show, Maxie, but uh, wouldn't you like to hear her first? Why? I have a feeling that her voice is just as beautiful as her face. <laughs> there you are so right. <laughs> okay, uh, to the piano, Miss Duffy, and let the listener take the hindmost. I'll be just delighted to sing. <clears throat> Sweet summer breeze Whispering trees Stars shining softly above Roses in bloom With its perfume Sleepy birds dreaming of love Faith in your arms Far from the lawn Daylight shall come But in vain Give me a stick and I'll kill it the wrong key. Close to my chest. Kiss me, kiss me again. Kiss me again. Kiss me again. Kiss me again. Well, there you are. There you are, Maxie. Now tell me. How did you like it? I've been fouled. <laughs> well, you see, after this, Maxie, maybe you'll leave everything to me. You bet I'll leave everything to you, Archie. The picking of the talent, the staging of the show, the choosing of the customs, and, uh, oh, yeah, one other thing. What? The raising of the money. Good night. <laughs> and that's Duffy's Tavern from... January, February, March, April. April 13th, 1951. In just a moment, we'll be back to answer our most queried question. The question that we're asked most often is, Dear Vic, what is your favorite old-time radio show? And I really can't give a single answer to that. Forgive me if I answer this every year or so, because we get a lot of folks who, for some reason, want to know. Uh, my favorite old-time single broadcast would have had to have been Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. I didn't hear that first time around, but I did hear... Uh, I had an older friend who told me about it. <laughs> and uh, as far as a continuing series would be concerned, it would have to be I Love a Mystery, Jack, Doc, and Reggie of the Ace Detective Company, written and produced by Carlton E. Morris, a true genius. My favorite comedian, comedy variety show, favorite comedian was Jack Benny, you see. So we want to thank you for listening to our show, you know. And our show is the Golden Age of Radio Theater. Victor Ives here. Join us next time we do this again and crank back the clock to relive the golden moments of radio's yesteryear and bring you some more of the greatest radio entertainment of all time. Bye-bye.